equaling this out between post-traumatic stress disorder and stress disorder <coughs> is um, the post-traumatic stress disorder can come um, months and years after the event and it, um, the acute stress disorder generally kicks in pretty rapidly. And the people, it is a clearly identifiable event that has created this trauma in their life that completely overwhelmed their ability, their normal strategies. And they're usually pretty awful things like some horrifying combat, um, sexual or physical assault, survivors of terrorist attacks, all kinds of big things. Um, and it's left an imprint on the on the mind, and the person has a feeling of imminent threat, and that they um, can be under attack at any time. So both of them have intense emotional reactions. Um, the PTSD has been the symptoms occur a month or more after the traumatic event. And it can be a lot of different things, really. They can feel very detached and numb. Uh, they can feel like they're reliving those events often, over and over again. They can kind of watch it from a distance and see themselves right back in that situation. You know, maybe you're a, you were a soldier surrounded by enemies and your friends were dying all around you. And, and you can watch it as if you're, you know, half a block away. Because you wouldn't want to, because you're kind of forced to. It just keeps coming back to you. So that people tend to seem very flat emotionally toward their loved one, maybe have trouble expressing any affection for them. And um, it gives, causes a lot of relationship problems. Uh, a lot of times, as we said, they develop substance abuse problems too. Uh, people will kind of deny that it's happening because I'm a strong person and I don't, I don't act like this, you know? So it, they may purposefully suppress it or they may, it may be just repressed in the background. They might not actually uh, know what's causing all of their problems, getting along with people, being able to work, may have problems controlling their temper. Um, and down there at the bottom where it says you couldn't even go to a barbecue, what about a barbecue, a family barbecue might cause a problem? Smell. Um, the smell. Maybe it said the smell of all the, the smoke or the meat. A sexually abusive relative. Smoke, being surrounded by people. All of, all of that might simulate a war experience. And, you know, oh, I'm using that, but it. as I said, it can be a lot of different things. It can be um, rape or any kind of assault, um, any kind of traumatic, big a traumatic event that happened. Um, and it really causes bad of people and people's lives. And I think the Veterans Administration ignored it and pretended it didn't happen for a long time. But um, they called it different things back in World War I and um, World War II. A lot of people came back from those wars and became alcoholics, but um, Vietnam, maybe it was different drugs than just alcohol. Um, a lot of, finally, I think after Vietnam, they slowly started, psychologists started realizing that this was a war, uh, often something that soldiers went through and started uh, giving them some credit and some help. A lot of people feel survivor's guilt, like why did I survive and so many of my friends didn't um, have some outburst of anger or violence that seem kind of unexpected and out of the blue, uh, very easily lose a temper. And then we talked about the substance abuse, um, suicidal ideation or attempts, insomnia, anxiety, depression, 
all of those affect the ability to take a job, stay in a relationship, leads to divorce, leads to spousal abuse, leads to homelessness. A lot of, a lot of bad things come about. Um, one of the things that you see now very often is that um, therapy dogs uh, can recognize when that person is becoming tense or stressed and kind of catch them in the escalation phase. It's like that um, uh, violent uh, cycle that we talked about not long ago. Uh, touching people as they're getting triggered and just starting to ramp up before they get too far into it. Uh, the dogs a lot of times will nudge their hands and, and move in and knock against them, rub against them, and kind of bring somebody out of it before that person even recognizes it's happening. And then once you can recognize and interrupt, you can kind of get control of it. So cognitive behavioral therapy, again, first line, because you have to recognize what's going on and have, a, have some things to substitute. Uh, emotionally focused therapy, especially with families and couples. Sertaline seems to be one of the most commonly described antidepressants. Paroxetine. Uh, Sertaline, I believe, is Zoloft, but um, I'm not sure. Paroxetine may be impactful, but that's not important to know. You've got to go with the general um, scenarios. So support groups, they say for the veterans, are really, really um, essential because they're the only people that they feel like can really understand what they're going through. So they really do need those support groups. Even if they're online support groups, like through the VA, they may be able to set up some support groups that where they meet in person once a month, but they might meet daily, you know, for some in a special chat room or something. I don't know exactly how the online support groups work, but I hear that so that they're pretty effective for people like if you're in Eden, Oklahoma, you may not have other veterans that of um, you know the Middle East that you can a large enough group that you can get together with and talk about your shared experiences uh, and maybe but in around the state of Oklahoma you could so um, the support groups I think are are essential to recognize have been recognizing that for quite a while. And even the victims of rape, maybe the parents of murdered children. I, you know, there's not going to be a support group that needed for parents of murdered children, but I'll bet you can find one online that your psychologist could hook you up with. So someone who understood what you had gone through, but not very many people have gone through. Okay. Not too many slides left. Uh, I did add a couple on the disassociation, but uh, psychotherapeutic management of PTSD, oh, we did this recently. So the somatic symptom disorder. There are a couple different with somatic disorders, but this is a common one. Especially if you work in an ER, um, <coughs> people who are having a lot of anxiety and but they don't really recognize that it's anxiety. It's displaced into physical symptoms. So they're not really conscious that it's a mental, uh, psychological thing. They're, they are completely focused on their physical symptoms, their somatic symptoms, so they tend to doctor shop. They'll go from one ER to another. Sometimes in the same night, they'll go to urgent care, go to different doctors, trying to find someone who will explain away what they're complaining of. Most often, it's pain. A lot of times, it's abdominal pain. It might be headache. But diagnostics don't find anything. They can have MRI and CAT scans and all of these things. I remember one fairly young woman who used to come to the ER where I worked with abdominal pain. I think she was in a 20s. And uh, the doctor went back into the medical records that were working one night. We weren't super, super busy for a change. And she also talked to uh, one of the docs that uh, 
fast, and between the two hospitals, in five years, this lady has had over 20 chest scans. And so the doctor I was working with, who was also female, told her, she said, you're gonna get cancer from this radiation if you keep doing this. You know, we, we, we've got to, I'm not sure that that was the right way to go about it, but it made sense to me. You really are, you're, you have nothing physical but if you don't seek psychological help, you're going to end up with cancer from this radiation. So I don't know that it stopped, but I know she quit coming to our ER for a while. So um, she at least moved, moved her. She probably, sometimes when you get mad at one ER doctor, you get to recognize their car, you won't go when they're there, that sort of thing goes on. But anyway, this wasn't drug seeking behavior. This is someone who truly believes there's something wrong, they're trying to get someone to figure out what it is. But people get frustrated with them. Their families get frustrated with them because they will always want to talk about these because of their stomach pain and their this and that. And you're like, oh gosh, do I really have to hear this story again? And uh, you know, they alienate their friends and they alienate the medical community. So it, it's a real problem. And then factitious disorder uh, is, um, fabricating illness for emotional gain or attention. And this can be uh, people who inject feces into their bloodstream or um, in, they might insert it with their hand into their urinary tract or deliberately cause themselves to get infections. Um, they might do that to, for them, to themselves or they might do it um, to one of their children. And it's for the secondary gain, it's called for the attention. And so these factitious disorder does, they know what they're doing. And uh, they just really, I guess, can't stop themselves. It used to be called Muchenhausen syndrome by proxy if they were doing it through their children uh, or Muchenhausen syndrome if they were doing it to themselves. But this is deliberate. The somatic symptom disorder is not. So for somatic symptom disorder, um, you are, you, you show concern for this person, but you're not overly concerned. So you kind of walk a little fine line there. The rationale is that you don't want that person to get secondary gain, excessive attention because of their somatic complaints. <laughs> and you ask them to describe their feelings. You're trying to get away from them talking about maybe, like I said, it's often abdominal pain, the pain, but you try to get them to talk about, you know, their emotional state. And because you're wanting them um, to make some connections between how they're feeling psychologically and, and think less about their somatic symptoms. Positive reinforcement, anytime they say they're feeling well, um, as far as, or they're not talking about their somatic problem. Um, being consistent in how you react to that person, uh, using diversion, trying to get them involved in other things. Limit setting, you know, if they talked about this for, you know, you may say, okay, you get to talk about your abdominal pain for two minutes and then it's someone else's turn to talk or we're going to talk about something else. So there's ways to um, to set the limits. Okay, so I added a slide. Let's see. Yes, there it is. Uh, disassociation. I, um, I thought these were really kind of rare and if I was going to run out of time, I was going to put them at the end. But then I stuck them back in because I figured I could find a way to do it. So the disassociative disorder, uh, we talked about, purposefully picked those out to make sure we covered in our activity with the three different kinds of disassociative anemia as amnesia. I keep wanting to say anemia, and I know it's not anemia. Being localized, generalized, or selective. There wasn't as much in the book about the selective and 
just as a recall, its body. You might remember some details that really um, are not as difficult, not as unpleasant, um, but not others. And of course, the generalized you talked about is the one they make movies about where people don't know their own name or their own wife or something like that. Uh, the depersonalization, derealization often happens to someone who's been very traumatized. All of, all of these actually have to do with trauma. Uh, but the depersonalization, derealization might be someone who has had, um, you know, was a victim of child abuse or something, and they tend to have some of these out of body experiences and feelings of detachment and numbness. Uh, it's not unlike PTSD, really, it's kind of similar in some ways without the, the rage and the substance abuse. Uh, and the flashbacks, not necessarily. <coughs> the disassociative identity disorder with the multiple distinct personalities. Um, usually it's only two from what I gather in the book. Sometimes in the movies it's 20 or more personalities in one body. But if the person has two distinct identities, they were going to have frequent blocks of amnesia where, you know, if, if my main identity is Janelle, but I have a Emily in here, well, when Emily's in charge, I will have no memory of what went on. Janelle doesn't know what goes on when Emily's there. Emily doesn't really know what's going on when Janelle is there. So they're gonna have a lot of times when there's memory loss. Um, In some cultures, um, they have said that they believe that people might be possessed when they have, you know, two personalities, that their alter personality is so much different than their real personality that that might be an experience of uh, possession. So generally they're, um, extremely different personalities, um, almost opposites. But besides the time loss uh, and memory problems, there's often some suicidal uh, issues, which I would probably think I was crazy, and I, I could understand why that would be suicidal. They might even talk differently, have a different voice, they might be a child, that sort of thing. I know you guys have, have a little bit of familiarity with that from the movie. I honestly thought it was probably not true for a while. I mean, when I first read Sybil, I didn't really know that I believed it. I think that um, the literature says that it does, does happen. It's just so rare that pro even people who work in sites for 40 years might never see it. So um, I didn't think we needed to spend much time on that one particularly. Um, Last three slides. Oh, do I have more slides? Yeah, they're, they're right here for extra slides. I'm totally fine with moving on this study session. That's fine. Um, the other question I had from somebody was on the thing they had them do at the beginning of class, their activity, are they turning those in, or you just need to know that they were, everybody's here and participated? 
Yes, if you will just let me know, um, you know, if anybody did not participate, okay. then that I can take care of that. Okay. Well, I can just put the grades in if you're not going if you don't need them. Okay. Okay. But yeah, whenever and however, whatever order you want to do that in. Okay. Let me go off my uh, slideshow and see what I think I can do. I have some okay. repetitive slides. Let me see if I can figure out because I have. You might be able to help me with this. Okay. What I had was types. Slide. Now I don't know how to unhide slide. When well, I always the next one. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it came up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It will. So some of this may be repetitive, and uh, yeah, we did talk about everything under the general anxiety disorder on that slide. Let's see. PTSD using relaxation techniques. Identify triggers and escalation. The student who went through the panic attacks did a very good job. I think maybe just kind of read through here and picked up those. Um, I don't remember the do not touch. I think our, our uh, inclination might be to pat somebody on the shoulder. So I'm not, I'm not sure, but not everybody likes to be touched. You can't just assume people want to be touched. But being very calm, and um, helping them to slow down their breathing. One thing I think new nurses sometimes do is tell them to take really slow, really deep breaths. And really we want more of a normalized breathing pattern, not a very, very deep breath and very, very slow. We just want them to get it to be kind of, kind of normal. So not so exaggerated. Um, letting them pace around and cry, reassuring them that, um, you know, because a lot of times people think they're having heart attacks, you, you do look them up to the monitor, you make sure that, because that um, helps them feel a little more secure too, to know they're on the monitor. I put people on, you know, the finger oximeter and just left it on the finger just because it made them feel good to look at it and see that it was in the 90s. Um, you know, we will tell them if you need oxygen, we'll put you on oxygen, but you're, you're great. You're, your oxygen percentage is better than mine. A lot of times I'll tell them that. And um, your heart rate is good. Even though they're feeling palpitations and feel like their heart's going 200 beats a minute, a lot of times it's, you know, 90. So it helps you don't you don't minimize what they're feeling but you do reassure them that that it is a panic attack and that, that it's a real thing you know um, because they think you're um i don't know minimizing them if when you say it's a panic attack and they say it's a heart attack so it's kind of hard to get them to realize that you're not being condescending or rude or um anything like that um, because that that's kind of the impulse when they're so sure that something really really bad is happening and that they're dying uh, bringing them back down from that kind of life. okay so individual therapy we didn't really talk about this too much individual is to usually to try to help people develop insight into what's going on in, you know with them and whereas in group, that might not, it might happen, um, but it's probably going to be a little faster, a little more individualized, obviously, group therapy, because the person who's working with them is focused on that individual instead of the group as a whole. Uh, the cognitive therapies help them change our automatic responses. I think I've told you before, I practice my own cognitive therapy on myself sometimes to try to have a positive internal dialogue going instead of waking up in the morning and start to worry about things, to wake up in the morning and say it's going to be a great day. You know? um, and then reminding yourself several times through the day that are related. So we talked quite a bit about the desensitization and the implosion therapy. I think that's why I blocked these slides because I felt like they were repetitive, but I've got one more here. Okay, evaluation. 
So of different kinds of anxiety, like the OCD, well, if they can spend less time in their compulsive behavior, and um, that progress, that's good. If they can live to recognize some precipit precipitating factors, that's certainly a good thing. So like where this comes from, so that's inside really. And then getting improved function, and then positive feedback from that, um, obviously, is the goal. We want everyone to have functional improvements. Um, with the generalized anxiety disorder, that positive internal dialogue, working at relaxation exercises, less reliance on medication, um, improved relationships, job performance, socialization. Once again, functional Someone with PTSD or <coughs> stress disorder, can they sleep without medication so their insomnia is improving? Um, have they gotten away from abusing substances? Um, having improved relationships with their loved ones uh, or at work, can they, can they work? Um, do they have some positive coping strategies that they can articulate and perform? So those are the kinds of things you can use for evaluation. The somatic um, illness, Somatic symptoms are they having decreased utilization of the ER and their urgent care facilities, doctor shopping? You know, if they're, if they're able to do that, then they're making progress. And spending less time talking about and thinking about their um, symptoms. Thank you. It was 